Good evening and welcome, folks, uh, to tonight's mashup of the Cover One Buffalo Show and Disguise Coverage. I am joined by my uh, temporary partner in crime, Anthony Prohaska. Um, obviously, tonight's show is going to be discussing what we all witnessed and experienced on Monday night, uh, what we've seen since then. Uh, we'll give you the latest update on the status of, of what's going on with DeMar Hamlin from the team and from his representatives. Um, and we'll talk through what comes next for the team. So, um, you know, we had a lot of internal discussion and debate tonight, uh, the last couple of days as a staff on whether we should do any content, whether we should be out here and to give you an example of that. Uh, Anthony and I spent a fair amount of time tonight trying to identify which background struck the right tone yeah. of not to be too overbearing. We, we were uh, conscious of what we were wearing. It's just, yep. um, it's a weird time to be a Bills fan, to be a Bills content creator, um, to try to be respectful and focus on obviously everyone's priority, which is Mar Hamlin's health while still trying to respectfully talk through this. So, um, you know, I, I hope you guys can share some grace with Anthony and I, we're going to do the best we can tonight. Uh, and hopefully you guys feel like we uh, strike those right chords. Yeah, you you hit it on the head. Like just the, yeah, so we each changed what we were initially wearing to like try and strike the right tone. It's just all a, the conversations you and I had last night via text today, you know, again, like you mentioned as a staff and it, and all of that, all of the, you know, awkwardness that we feel in this space. And then additionally, as like fans of football and fans of the Buffalo Bills, or the stress or sadness or anxiety, whatever we feel, all of that just melts and pales in comparison to what Tamar Hamlin's family is feeling and his friends and the team. And that obviously compounds with what we're feeling as well. And it's just, yeah, it's this unprecedented scenario. And, um, you know, again, to, to your point, that's why we've, you know, done this mashup episode tonight and just trying to talk things out and be an outlet of sorts and try and navigate these, again, uncharted waters for, really any sports fan, especially a Buffalo Bills fan and kind of what happens now and going forward and just all of it, just a wild time. Absolutely. So um, let's start with the, um, the important part of the evening. We're going to give two updates on the latest that we know um, on DeMar Hamlin's status. The first was an announcement from the Buffalo Bills later this afternoon, um, just stating that DeMar remains in the ICU in critical condition with signs of improvement noted yesterday and overnight he is expected to remain under intensive care as his healthcare team continues to monitor and treat him. Um, in everyone that I've spoken with, multiple people that are professionals on the topic um, have chimed in. This is very standard procedure. No one should read into anything on him still being sedated and intubated. Anytime someone experiences cardiac arrest, this is very standard for the first 24 to 36 hours to be um, maintained in that uh, kind of care status so that that's uh to be expected and, and not something mm -hmm. to be read into uh, and that was reiterated by jordan rooney who is um his marketing representative and has kind of acted as a spokesman for the family here in the short term um stating uh here that the family they feel good about the progress they've had positive progress up to this point they feel like they're taking steps in the right direction um, but that, again, he reiterated beyond here that they're not out of the woods yet. Um, mm -hmm. They're not ready to give any detailed updates, but they, they feel like they're making positive progress. Um, and I, I know personally it was all of us want the update to come through that, hey, uh, they took DeMar off of oxygen and off of sedation and he woke up and asked, hey, did we win? You know, that, that's what everybody wants. And that um, I still, you know, obviously hope that, that we do get an update like mm -hmm. that at some point, but we also need to be realistic that it, it may take a while. That may be a long journey. There may be a lot of steps between now and getting that update. Um, but that at least hearing it's going in the right direction, they're getting positive updates is uh, that first step in the right direction. Yeah, that's very well said. I, and I think it's, it's juxtaposing it with, what we usually see in these scenarios where, you know, player is transported to the hospital and then x-rays are negative and they're good to go. And honestly, even comparing it to Dane Jackson, you and I were talking offline about it. I was at that Monday night game against Tennessee and he gets carted off and I'm freaking out because I've never seen any, I haven't seen an ambulance come and take a player off since 
I felt like the Madden 93 graphic when somebody got injured in Sega Genesis. And I'm like, this, this is bad. And then a couple hours later, it's like, nope, x-rays are negative. And then he's back playing two weeks later. And I feel like that's we're, we're used to, okay, player gets carted off. They still give the thumbs up. Everybody claps. They're fine. They might be out for a couple weeks or the year, but we know they're okay as far as their life. Maybe Personal like lives, they're playing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like maybe how much they play this year or coming soon is in jeopardy. And we're not getting that or and from the playing side, but also from the life side with DeMar. But again, to your point, I think with something of this magnitude, it wasn't going to be 24 hours. He's good to go. 48 hours. He's good to go. It's a progression type of thing. And we're hearing positive notes about that progression. I think more importantly, we're not hearing any setbacks. It's not things took a turn or there's no comment. Um, we're getting those little by little nuggets of positivity. And I think that's all that you can expect given the severity of what happened. Yeah. Um, and we don't plan to spend a lot of time uh, on this portion tonight, but we do want to talk a little bit about the incident itself and, and kind of what our experience was like in, in watching it. And, you know, you and I are both, you know, obsessive football fanatics, you know, yeah, anytime <laughs> football's on, like I, I, I've been watching more football than any normal adult should for, for 20 plus years. Um, so you, you understand the rhythms of what happens. Sadly, mm -hmm. we are pretty conditioned to even scary injuries of, you know, a lot of people will talk about some of the coverage in a moment here, but you know, some of the guys talk about their experience of like, Oh, this guy got hurt in practice. All right, move down 15 yards. Cause the show's got to go on. And mm -hmm. that even moments that you talk about like Dane Jackson being, you know, placed onto a backboard and an ambulance taking him off the field. You know, if we think back to that, it was, all right, guys, let's get ready. And the game yeah. went on and, and like everybody moves on. Like we are conditioned to that. And that watching this, the first thing that struck me was I noticed the urgency of the training staff. I noticed their movements were not, what I was used to seeing and that it's just immediately struck me. Oh, that that's not right. That's not how they react to a broken arm, a torn ACL of a shoulder out of socket, like even serious injuries like those that that's not how they move and how they yeah. react. And then they cut away to commercial pretty quickly and come back. And now like, all time pros like Joe Buck and Troy Aikman were kind of speechless and didn't know what to say. And they start sharing terms like CPR mm -hmm. and that my mind immediately goes to, you know, the, this isn't some coworker thinking they need to help somebody. These are professionals who know mm -hmm. you don't do CPR unless someone's heart has stopped And that all of a sudden it immediately became very real that this is no longer a football situation. This is now a life and death situation. And I just, I don't ever remember, like I wasn't, well, I know some people have brought up some of the, the skate incidents in hockey where someone oh, the was Zednik hit in incident. the neck. Yeah. I, I wasn't I watching watch live it. then. I, I wasn't watching Hank gather live. I wasn't mm. watching Reggie Lewis live. Like sadly, people have lost their lives during live sporting events before this yeah. was the first time I was ever watching a sporting event where it flipped to a real life emergency event. And it, it was just very surreal to experience. I think that's a good way to put it. Um, you know, I, I actually was watching the Zednik skate to the throat um, live, but in, and it was, it, when it was severe the whole time, but it was like, Oh, but then everybody reacted and it was like, oh, okay, like he's going to be okay. It was shocking and jarring given what you'd seen. But it had kind of, I don't want to say calm down, but the you were still concerned, but the high, high anxiety started to dissipate as things went forward. But it was the opposite here um, with Hamlin, at, at least for me. I At first, I didn't know who was down. I saw Poyer yeah. come flying up. And I thought Poyer, like his leg got bent under. So I thought it was Poyer. And then I was rewinding it, but I was like, no, he gets up like, what's going on? I couldn't see what was happening. And then I saw it was Hamlin and I kept rewinding it. And when he collapsed, my first thought was kind of like what happened to Tua in week three. I was like concussion and he stood up too fast and he went down. Yeah. But the way he went down, like his, he just, he went limp. And then again, I 
power of TV, I rewound it and I was like, he didn't get hit in his head. And I was like, did he get hit in his chest? But then again, still I'm thinking he'll be fine. He'll be all right. I was remembering the Chris Pronger thing yep, um, when yep. a similar thing happened with him. Also really cool of him to tweet out some kind words and yeah, share his, his, his experience. Yep. And he, you know, the, he did experience Kamoshio Cordis. Yep. Um, and they did confirm that that hasn't been confirmed in Hamlin's case. It is the leading assumption yes, by, by many that. medical uh, people and that he experienced that and then went on to play 12 more years in the NHL yeah, and, great and, and sent that as a level of encouragement that, you know, yeah. Hey, you know, everybody's prayers and thoughts are with you and then there can still be more for your story. Yeah. And Pronger, for those who don't know, was it, as he continued on, ex- like one of the most physical defensemen in NHL yeah. history. So it didn't like change his style or what kind of game that he played. And yeah. And then I, I was always worried, but I was still thinking again, like, okay, they'll, they'll put him on a cart or something. He'll wave or they'll carry him off the field. Lawrence comment okay. spot on. Oh yeah. Lawrence saying, you know, getting the thumbs up shouldn't be something we've become so conditioned to expect yet. We kind of allow ourselves to move on. Once we see that it's weird to think about now. Exactly. Like I was just expecting things to be okay. And it's, and I think that often happens even for like, I, I, I think myself personally, like I'm very cognizant of like the human element of football, even with, when it comes to free agency, I'm like, you know what, it's, it's a short life, lifespan, short shelf life, go out, get your money. I'd love for dudes to, I want to win a championship, but I get it when some dudes are like, no, I'm trying to cash in before I have to cash out. And I don't know if it's, whether it's because they're professional athletes or the money professional athletes make, or because they have celebrity status or any of the multitude of reasons. But I think it's easy for people to often detach the human element yes. from professional yes. athletes or even football players and athletes, again, in general. And I think they often get seen as somewhat of like a commodity, whether it's because of like fantasy sports or just like that's a dude on my team or a dude that's yep. against my team. Like whatever the reason, I think it gets lost that despite the fact that they live lives that many of us will never know or fathom. And the even add in yeah. the, the, the cliches that get thrown out there that you're rooting for laundry next man up the free agency mentality. Yeah. It's all those things that lead into the commoditization, the dehumanization yeah. of individual players. And I know at, at cover one, we have a lot of relationships with players. So we're often biased, gen, you know, acknowledge that our bias, okay. um, but are very, very pro player and that, you know, we're mm-hmm. always going to be supportive of guys going out to get as much money as they can, being mm-hmm. able to do that because of the short shelf life and those things that come into it. But it, it did very quickly bring that into to focus that night. Yeah. Like it just, it, and it's so crazy too, like, because they're like in peak physical condition and strength, like those dials are turned up to a thousand, but despite all of the the money or the fame or their health, like, I, they're still just human beings. They're still just like regular people. Maybe regular is, you know, relative yeah. and, but, but they have families and they have fears. They have hopes. They win, they lose, they get hurt. Like they're not invincible. And I think this was the harsh, like, unfortunately, like reminder that, especially in a game like football, where, you know, some like snap to snap, you're not necessarily taking your life in your hands, but I don't know, a knee an Achilles, a shoulder, a neck, a concussion, like any snap could, cost you significant time in your career at some point. And it's just that risk reward in football is on display at all times. And I don't think we necessarily see the level of it, but I think with DeMar Hamlin, you saw an extreme version of it that kind of put it into perspective of, you know, what the players risk when they put themselves on the field, even though they know it and they sign up for it and they wear equipment. um, It's still a very, very, very dangerous game. Um, so some comments here from our guys over at uh, If the Walls Could Talk in Buffalo, Great Josh comment. and Don, you know, makes you appreciate the medical staff on hand. And um, this was something we talked about pre-show that um, Dr. Chow, who does some of the injury analysis on Twitter, uh, made a comment that is odd as it sounds, besides like the, you know, the, the lobby of an emergency room in NFL fields, one of the safest places you can go into cardiac arrest, because instead of being at a workplace where you, you might have somebody who is trained in CPR and that they're going to do the best they can. Mm -hmm. You actually have trained professionals, you know, EMTs there prepared in the moment to immediately analyze the situation. They have all the equipment. So, you know, having AEDs there to be able to conduct and and do what's necessary to get your your heart back in rhythm and, and to get everything going, you know, those people 
we don't know how this is going to turn out. We we know that there's a wide spectrum of outcomes for DeMar Hamlin here. And we're all praying that it's on the right side of that spectrum. Yeah. But in the moment, those people saved his life. His heart stopped. He he was he was dead in the moment. Um, and that they saved his life and gave him a chance yeah. to now fight for everything that he can still have in life. And we obviously that's what we praise is the outcome here. But they saved his life in that moment to be able to give him this opportunity to to fight. And it's it's amazing that those people were able to do that. And it did inspire me. Um, I saw a handful of people talk about this was the impetus that I needed. Uh, I scheduled uh, CPR training for my mm. office at work. And I saw multiple people with messages like that. And I, I will admit I am not trained in CPR. I haven't been in 20 years um, mm. in the, doing that. And that I, I do plan to go through that. And that we have had that discussion today at work of, about you know, hosting a CPR course uh, and, and to get everyone certified, anyone who wants to, to, to be able to do that. So I, I hope more people take that uh, lead to, to do. Yeah. I, I honestly think like other than like movies or TV shows, I don't think I've ever seen like a live CPR just saved this person's life type of thing. And then you get it. I mean, we, we, we get it during school. Like you get those like, oh, this is how you do CPR. But I mean, you're in school. You don't take it like as the most serious thing. But you got exactly your point. You got a real life like something as simple as CPR is the reason Damar Hamlin is still fighting to recover and live life. Like just that that simple thing that you get taught in school and you kind of blow off. Like exactly like Brian saying in the comments there, like learn CPR, learn AED. You never know exactly like something as simple as that is the reason DeMar Hamlin is still with us right now. And I instead of it being, you know, the opposite scenario, which would have been absolutely tragic. Yeah. Um, a little bit more from that night. Um, obviously I, I was really impressed with ESPN's coverage uh, of the, the moment. I think that mm. most of the folks uh, during the event did a, a really nice job. There are some people, I think there was some speculation. John Perry uh, caused a little bit of stir in the, five minute warm up comments. It sounds like that was some miscommunication between the league office and John Perry, who is the rules official for the Monday night coverage and his comments to Joe Buck and, and where that got, you know, it, it sounds like misconstrued. We'll, we'll assume. Yeah. I felt um, bad because I definitely jumped on that gun initially. I was like agreed. five same. minutes. And then I was like, same. Oh, my fault. <laughs> I did the same. I, I did the same. And I, I, I believe them and take them at their word. I do not believe anyone organically said, Nope, the show must go on. <laughs> Give them five minutes and let's get back going again. I do believe I, I am trained in multiple emergency situations as a mm -hmm. an office manager and as a, a pseudo leader in, in, in the companies that I work for. Um, I know there's protocol that we're trained to follow. And when you're in emergency situations, your brain kind of snaps into that. And I do believe that some people brought up like, well, like normally we do like a five minute warm up to to get the guys back ready. I do believe that somebody brought that up and said like, Hey, is that what we're supposed to do here? And I'm glad, and we'll get to Sean Taylor or Zach Taylor and Sean McDermott here in a moment. Um, I'm glad that the right answer absolutely was immediately yeah. found, but I, I don't think that makes someone horrible that they were through, like just, they were grasping in panic in the moment to be like, Hey, what do we normally do in these situations? Um, and I'm glad the right answer was found, but I, I think that that was very easy and we'll get to some people later on that commented about, you know, people's need to find a villain. Um, Ooh, and that just in tragic situations, th there isn't always a villain. There isn't always a bad guy to blame in that we, even though some people want to park their frustration and anger in a, a, a villain, it, it, there isn't always a bad guy to, to blame in some of these situations. Yeah, I think that's also like a, a nice comparison for that is like when even just when like a team loses, like the Bills, for example, like people want to just they want that one vessel to harness all their angle. Be like the reason we lost is because Sean that McDermott, guy. yeah, or like Dane Jackson missed this tackle or yeah. so and so dropped this pass. And it's like, yeah, I get it. But that one thing is in an yeah. ocean of plays that happen in a game. It's never as simple as just one player or one player, one side of the ball. But you want that. You want to be able to harness your anger into something and focus it. And I think, yeah, the, the initial reaction was the NFL, especially given I feel like the NFL is – and I'm not defending the NFL because I think – Oh, it's easy to hate Roger, Roger yeah, Exactly. Like they've made their bed in a lot of instances. <laughs> they often have to line it. And so I think any, any opportunity 
to jump on the NFL combined with, to your point, wanting to harness and hone in that anger and blame in order to alleviate some of the stress and tension. I think it all, yeah, just pinpointed into that scenario. And um, yeah, good to know we got some clarification on it as, you know, we kind of got some clues as the inner workings of it. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, later that night, I thought Ryan Clark was very poignant and did a great job with Scott Van Pelt. Even some guys I don't love, uh, Booger McFarland and Adam Schefter, who did like from an analysis, like he's fine breaking news, but his analysis is, you know, not my favorite. We're both very frank and transparent. I love, uh, someone in the comments here, um, talking about how they focused on the, the human side mm-hmm. of it. Like they were talking about what a great person DeMar Hamlin is yeah. and the impact that he had. And, you know, the heartbreak of thinking about, you know, DeMar Hamlin's mom coming out of the stands and having to watch them perform CPR on, on her son, like that, those kind of human moments were, I was really impressed with the way that they talked about it and, and the way they approached it. And that led into the people I was probably most impressed with was, the people who didn't allow it to become standard procedure and didn't allow them to Mm -hmm. simply go on with the show with Sean McDermott and Zach Taylor and Mm -hmm. Zach Taylor's comments today that we all saw him kind of come across the field. And he said the first words out of Sean McDermott's mouth were, I shouldn't be coaching in this game. I should be with DeMar at the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that I love that our team is coached by a man that that was his first instinct. And that if you think about someone it, don't get me wrong. I, I am a bit of a Sean McDermott apologist. I am. Um, I spend because I think he unfairly gets criticism. It seems like I never criticize him and he is imperfect. He is not a perfect mm. coach. He has no. his flaws. My big gripe is normally he is a huge net positive and he brings more positive to the table than negative. And we yes. haven't had that in 25 years. So <laughs> I'm really happy to have that and that we should be thankful to have someone who brings more positive to the table than negative last night should galvanize that for everyone. All the things of the culture he's built, the way that he gets like grown men, alpha male type guys to talk about how they love each other Mm -hmm. and about how it's a family and that they love the man next to them and explaining why they're there and why they sacrifice and do the things that they do so that everyone understands why it's important not to let that man next to you down because he told you why this is important for him and what it means to him. He's the one who's built that. He is mm-hmm. the one who has built that culture and made it okay for those you know big tough guys to say, I love you. I love being able to play with you. I love you, man. And last night, or you know, Monday night, really brought that into focus of how lucky we are to have him as a leader and as the man in charge of this organization. And I love that that was his immediate instinct of what he defaulted to. His leadership and, you know, it's been talked about so much since the bills have kind of turned things around under he and Brandon beans uh, stewardship since they took over, but like the culture piece, it gets thrown around so much, but I really don't think like, like you alluded to, I don't think people really understand how hard it is to get like 50 plus adult men in general, very different backgrounds, different experiences, different perspectives. Yep. To get on the same page for something. Then add in the fact they're all extremely wealthy and they make a ton of money, which like muddies the waters in terms of egos and attitudes and who you vibe with and who you don't. Motivation. Exactly. Like it's so hard to galvanize an NFL locker room and instill a continuous culture with core players. And then new players then come in. You bring in new players and they just assimilate to the culture. They just become one with it. And just it just keeps on moving. And that's because of Sean McDermott. It's because of Brandon Bean. And it's also so easy, not so easy, but it's easy to be easier to be a leader or a good teammate when things are going well. When you're up and you're winning all the time, it's easy to be the guy at the forefront and the mouthpiece and so on and so forth at the head of the table, whatever you want to go with. It's not easy to be the leader when the chips are down and you're going through adversity and you're in trying times or tough times or bad times. And this is as trying and as tough as it gets when a player on your team literally 
dies i hate that there's this wild car outside revenant's engine i don't know if anybody hears it it's insane yeah, i barely feel like yeah, we, I feel we like can it's only barely hear we can only I'm barely, going outside, barely going outside. it's you have a player who literally died and i think you have players who when, when you see the tearful reactions from everyone mm. they i feel like they thought that they just lost demar hamlin and you have a coach who has the wherewithal and the leadership and the mental fortitude and the principle to steer the ship and guide it in that moment and not only make the right decision, but make the right decision when it's hard to make the right decision. And that is a tremendous thing. And I understand people will, will still knock him for whatever people have X's and O's worries or concerns or bothered by so many things, but it's just so rare to have a great leader be the coach of your football team and, and, and a great for as much as we know, we can see a great human being. Like he is the person that you want as a coach, as a teacher, as a neighbor in your life. Like he, it's just a really tremendous thing that someone of that caliber is leading a football team. And it happens to be, you know, the team that we love the most. Yeah. Yeah. I, I made a comment and I, I believe, believe it genuinely Monday night showed me he can have a lifetime contract as the bills coach. Like I, I am perfectly comfortable with him as a leader in perpetuity. Um, and the, obviously I hope it's because he brings a trophy to this city and that he just keeps all winning the other things that come with it. And like, <laughs> it's, you know, for all the other reasons. Um, but that I, I, I'm just very thankful that he was the man in charge and I, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but, um, kudos to Zach Taylor. Um, I think that he handled that in the comments from Joe Burrow today. Um, the captains from the Bengals coming into the locker room to support the team, um, I, I thought that they handled this as well as anyone can. Um, and that really brings me into our next topic is how far reaching this went outside of Buffalo and our little bubble. And, you know, we, I think Bill's mafia, we're getting a little bit used to our team, getting a little bit more attention and getting a little bit more spotlight in some of those different things, but we're certainly not used to the idea of, you know, getting spotlight outside of our football bubble. And, you know, here, this was the front page of the New York Post today describing DeMar Hamlin and a huge picture of him as America's son, nation praise for Bill's safety after horrifying incident. Um, and I can tell you, I work for an international company. I work for a German company. Um, the vast majority of our employees are not in the U.S. And... I was on, I don't know, eight or nine different conference calls today. Every single call, people ask me about it. Multiple people from outside the country are in our Cover One Slack channel. People from Australia and England both wrote me about how it was leading the news in those countries. Today, the president of the United States called Damar Hamlin's mom to speak with her at length about what was going on. It led every morning show, every news show, every non-sports show, um, people at work that I know vaguely know that football exists and like doesn't even know when football season is, were asking me about it, like, oh, hey, how's that guy on your team doing? Or, you know, that was crazy. And this is everywhere. This is the lead story in America right now. And it's just very surreal to have such a rallying point and, and no better example is that DeMar and people are learning what a great human he is, what he's done for his hometown. The reason he stayed in Pittsburgh to stay with his six year old uh, um, brother, instead of going to Ohio state or Penn state or Alabama, um, he had a toy drive that he was just trying to raise money for kids in his neighborhood in Pittsburgh. And he had a goal of $2,500 and that fund right now has almost $6 million in it because people and humans want something to reach for. And in the same energy as wanting a villain to point your energy towards, they also want to feel like they're doing something and that, Hey, what can I do? How can I help? And to have over 200,000 individual people, many of the villains, we like to point at some of the biggest donations were Robert Kraft and Tom Brady and a lot of people that we don't always love on the football field. This was a unifying force. Multiple people um, in the cover one fantasy football uh, leagues that we had mm -hmm. reached out to me that I was a commissioner in and wanted us to donate the money 
from the prize pool to Demar Hamlin's fund. Uh, Kel here saying it's almost seven million dollars now. Yeah, um, just unbelievable, okay. unbelievable to see something positive. And again, I, I joked earlier about it, all we want to see is Demar to come out of this and to ask if we won, and for them to say, well. They canceled the game because of you. Right. But, hey, we did raise $7 million for you to give an awful lot of toys to kids. Um, just incredible to see everything outside of here become centered on praying for tomorrow. Yeah, just the the the, the overseas piece is what hit me. You know, you mentioning it, and um, I've got a couple friends who live in England. And then, yeah, saying, like, this was the lead story here, like, Tuesday morning and Tuesday afternoon and night. And I was just like, oh, my goodness, they're, like, they're still talking about it today. And just the back and forth conversation with that. And I mean, Chris Jericho, the wrestler, being one of the yeah. people donating to, you know, the, the, the drive for DeMar Hamlin and just even seeing, granted, it's in the football sphere, but all of the – the football teams in the NFL on Twitter, like changing their logo All their to avatar. The tomorrow. Yeah. Like, and almost every coach saying something in their pressers in the middle of the yeah. week. And it wasn't, it wasn't like your generic, um, Oh, Hey, let's just say something. Cause we have to say something. It was, it seemed genuine. It seemed heartfelt. It seemed real. Like, and you're seeing that not just in the NFL sphere or the football sphere, but you're seeing it, across sports across industries across the world really like and i think he hit it on the head the same vein that people want to be united in something it could be hate or it can be love <laughs> and it's grown to that love piece like just this has been really support. cool to see. yeah it's been a really tremendous thing and yeah shout out to just everyone who who has been so kind-hearted shout out to zach taylor um yeah the Bengals players as well even though before that i was super mad at hayden hurst and um trey hendrickson and i think that role on trey hendrickson was on purpose that's a conversation for another time yeah. but they yeah just for, for burrow and i think karis and dj reader the captains to kind of come together and then go to zach taylor and then take it upon themselves like there was just so much so much organic support and it wasn't just for the cameras or for well we think we should do this so we will like and, you, and not just in that nfl sphere just in such a wide scope, it's really been a tremendous thing to behold. And I think it'll make this even more special, you know, trying to put good vibes out there when he wakes up and when he comes to, and it's like, Hey man, like, look at like, you know, the president just called your mom, like, and look at all this support. Like you're getting like, <laughs> yeah. it's just gonna Can yeah. you imagine that waking up and being like, what happened? They'll be like, well, your mom just talked to president Biden. Um, and you're the biggest <laughs> story all over the world. So, Welcome so, back. uh, glad you're back, man. Yeah, yeah. this is great. Uh, everybody's worried about you. Um, you know, a couple of other things, um, just as we kind of wrap up on, on the, the night itself, um, you know, anyone who had any anger for T Higgins was crazy. Like that was, that was a completely wild. normal, innocuous football play. Um, he was playing I hard. Even, he was just doing his job. Yeah. Like I, there was even one show and I, I wish I could think of who it was cause I want to call them out that made a comment about him lowering his helmet and like, come on, man. Like it, Scott, it might've been, it might've been. And that like, this was, there was, he did nothing wrong. This is a totally normal play. He was trying to get some extra yards and burrowing down. Like all of our guys do every single mm -hmm. play. Um, I believe he spent a great deal of time at the yeah. uh, hospital with Demar Hamlin was there with the family. It was um, the picture of him leaving the arena and he's hugging his mom and his like head is on yeah. her shoulder. And you can tell that he just looks physically like great. Oh, just reading into wait it. On it just him. Like, yeah. Yeah. Just wait on him. And that, you know, no one wants to be responsible for, for that. No one wants to, you know, be, you know, to, to feel like they did that and that, it's crazy to try to put that on him. So, you know, no one yeah. should have any ill feelings for T, T. Higgins. He did nothing mm -hmm. wrong here. And, and that's crazy to even think of. Um, no. I also heard something that the, it, it was scientific and potent, it was, I think sport Bible tweeted it or something from like doctors that, you know, what physically happened with DeMar? Like it just, he took that shot to the heart in between like beating rhythms. And it was yeah. like a one in 264 million shot or just something like yeah. random. Like he just got hit literally in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. T Higgins was just making a football play. It's unfair, yeah. man. And that's also part of it too. Like it's, I just would, how do he, I mean, obviously he feels a bit distraught, but like just knowing that like Hamlin is in that position because of, you know, like if you're sitting there, like what I did to him, yeah, it's just, and then you got people trying to pile on. It's just unfortunate. Yeah, it's crazy. He didn't do anything crazy. wrong. 
Um, and, and, I mean, you talk about the obsessive amount of football that we hit. We see people get hit in the chest over and over All and over again. L- literally in the, in the history of the NFL, millions of times, this is just a completely freak accident to, yeah. to be able to do so. Just super um, and, and talking about, I think Michael here was making some comments about, you know, it's made made it harder to hate some of the people that donated, like Julian Edelman and Tom Brady. Right. Um, and, and one that really struck me mm-hmm. was Nick Wright, and that um, I normally am very comfortable separating the fact of acknowledging Nick Wright plays a character. I've yeah. seen enough of his uh, podcast where he's spoken very eloquently mm-hmm. on the Brittany Griner situation and on um the uh anti-semitism uh yeah, the Kyrie situation piece. comments by Kyrie Irving and he is very eloquent he's very intelligent he is very sincere he does his um, research he he, he does he's, he's he does. very well spoken yes he does realize that leaning into his sports hate character and that sadly he's from Kansas City and he's very open about his bias about the Chiefs and that the biggest threat to the chiefs are the bills. So he leans into it. And then he goes three steps too far because he knows the rage quote tweets and the yep. hate shares and all the, Oh my God, can you believe what this guy said? And we share his videos everywhere is the reason he makes eight figures a year. And that, that's why he made so much money to help in that moment. Um, to realize that even while he's in character, even while he's on his show, He showed up with a Bills hat on today, ranking the Bills as the number one team in his tiers with the comment, this week, everybody, no matter what NFL city you're from or who you root for, there's a part of you, if not all of you, rooting for the Bills. And that even a guy who makes his living off of enraging us and getting (laughs) us to, to react to his crazy outlandish comments, even put that out there to say that, hey, you know, I can t- take my character hat off and stop pretending in the moment and that we're all rooting for you and we're all uh, wishing for the best. And that, you know, whether it's seeing donations from Tom Brady and Robert Kraft or mm-hmm. seeing human moments from Nick Wright, this was truly a unifying moment to see everybody come together. You had a good piece offline um, when we were talking and changing backgrounds and sweat- sweaters and stuff. <laughs> Um, of how Nick Wright plays to like, like the wrestling heel heel character. Like he plays it up, whether it's the wrestler or the heel commentator and in wrestling, like whenever, whenever someone breaks character or breaks kayfabe, like it's a, it's a big deal. Like, you know, whether it's, you know, to enhance a storyline or something in a match or because something serious happened, like, you know, that whatever the reason they did it for, it has gravitas and it means something. And yeah, to see like him do that while this wasn't him on his podcast to your point, like this was him like in character still doing this, like you, that just carries weight and it carries power to be able to get again, like people of all walks of life professions, whether they like sports, whether they don't like sports, whatever they do are all focused in on this topic and unified by it to a degree and their generosity and kindness and prayer and thought. And it, it's a, such a terrible and tragic thing that happened, but it's yielded some like beautiful moments and beautiful things that we've seen. And it's, I just really, it, that pushes me even further to want the best for Damar even more. So that way we can really truly appreciate all the beauty in this moment by really seeing him come out the other side, like healthy and strong to be able to really put a nice bow on it. Cause it, we've, we've seen some really, you know, cool stuff from people. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a, a really great, you know, response to a scary and terrifying yeah. tragic moment um and that you know we're, we're hoping obviously for for the best outcome for demar but it's very scary in the moment and that seeing yeah. this is a positive that came from it so um i know one other piece that came up and someone in the comments actually even asked about you know is a fifth or sixth round pick in in their third year you know a wealthy man um he, he's not He's not. He uh, Demar Hamlin had a hundred and twenty six thousand dollar signing bonus. He makes eight hundred twenty five thousand uh, dollars a year before taxes. Uh, that that that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Yeah, I'll say I take it. <laughs> that, don't get me wrong. That's a lot of money. That's not generational wealth. He's not taken care of for the rest of his life. Um, there were some really good um, clarifying messages, specifically Robert Smith. If you guys remember mm-hmm. the Ohio State and Minnesota Vikings running back, shared some of the things that if God forbid. Um, 
you know, he's not able to recover and is, you know, even as far as being disabled, he would be taken care of it. You know, I think it's like $200,000 a year for life with his coverage. Um, but he's not a vested veteran and, and that, you know, it's, it's, there is a scary element here that I certainly hope between the bills or the NFL or the NFL PA that, um, this is a situation where he would be taken care of if, if again, God forbid, he's not able to return to play. Um, mm-hmm. but that, you know, it is the reality here of, you know, the NFL can be not for long. It can be that any moment mentality. And I know that that's something that, that certainly strikes you. Yeah, it's 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 such a finite career that you have in the NFL. And you see so many players who come in and go out and come in and go out. And again, it goes back to the fact that they're, all vulnerable, just like we are granted they're bigger and stronger and faster. And it's, again, it's tied to the, at the the core of what we have, you know, football is X's and O's and scheme and design and play calling. But at the core of it, it's dudes who are blessed with God given ability or size or both trying to get as big and as strong and as fast as they can to then slam into another big, strong, fast dude who's also slamming into them as hard as they can. Like it's a game that is based on and predicated upon violence. And it's a form of entertainment for us that we consume to nth degrees over and over again. But at the end of the, like the day, it's, it's still a very violent game. And we, I, I think it goes back to that, you know, commodity piece of you know what we how we kind of treat professional athletes and football players and you know again granted they they know all the risks when they sign up but it doesn't make it any less real and then it even if you think about too like even if even if you get through and you have a long and successful nfl career what does your mental and physical health look like when your career is done because a long and successful football career isn't exactly synonymous with long-term mental and physical health or comfortability. I I always remember, I don't remember what I was watching, but I remember seeing Earl Campbell years after. Yes. And for, for those who don't know, Earl Campbell, extremely physical running back for the Houston Oilers guy who would literally bury his helmet into your chest to run you over just a monster. He he was like the Derrick Henry of the seventies and and yeah, who sought out contact, but actually ran over you while he did it. And he was just like, he was talking and he, he was okay mentally, but he's just making like oatmeal and his hands are just shaking because he has such bad arthritis. We're and seeing him insane. ever walk across the stage. It's yes. an incredibly painful experience. to So to painful, let alone all the, the multitude of CTE cases and all these other things that we see. And it's, it's a short shelf life and it can be dangerous even when you get through a long and successful career. And then you add in the pieces of, you know, who can receive a pension and who cannot. And some of the things that yeah. some people are trying to get at, although incorrectly, but you know, you the need spirit to spirit of those. what they were talking yes. about in the short shelf life, the, the next man up mentality and the cold reality of the NFL yeah. was very accurate. Even if everything they said wasn't. Spot. Yeah. And there are some, like, there are some benchmarks you have to hit, you know, you have to be a vested NFL player to receive a pension and certain benefits, which and being a vested player, you have to play for at least three seasons and how each season gets accredited and, you know, all the minutia of that, that I don't want to bog down everybody with, but you do need, you do need to hit certain benchmarks and it's hard to do in this league, which again, goes back to something we talked about earlier. That's why like in that free agency period, everybody's always like, I shouldn't say everybody, it's too blanket of a term, but you know, Oh, this guy's so selfish. I can't believe he chased the money. Like, well, you know, there's a big difference between getting like 10 million guaranteed or like 30 million guaranteed. That's also a piece too. Like, Football contracts aren't guaranteed like baseball contracts or like NBA contracts. So that's why guys chase that guaranteed money because they don't know when they could be the next Joe Theismann or somebody who suffers an injury and you're done. Like you have to make sure you can take care of yourself and take care of your family. And yeah, just this whole piece, just, I think it it connects so many avenues of player health and safety mentally, physically. Like how do you go forward as a team? If you're the bills, what do players careers look like? What do all all these on and off the field aspects? It's really kind of brought a lot of thoughts to the surface that I think have always been there, but don't necessarily get put on the forefront because most of the conversation is, Oh, you know, I can't believe they called cover two against this pass concept and they lost, man, that sucks. Like that's usually what it is. Yeah. And it's just a cold reality. And I hope that, 
if anything comes from this one, I hope that people do go get CPR training and instant positives there. I hope it is a momentary unifying uh, moment before we go back to hating each other for some other weird reason. And I do <laughs> hope it helps a little bit of perspective in the way that we talk about athletes in the dehumanized way. Oh, that guy's a bum. Oh, get that guy out of here. What a, he only scored trash. five like, fantasy points for me. He sucks. I hate him. It's just like, a- yeah, I, I hope that people take a little bit more perspective to remember the humans that are out here doing these things uh, for it. Um, So obviously, you know, we've spent 45 minutes now talking about the most important part here, which is DeMar Hamlin praying for his recovery, hoping that he has the absolute best case scenario and our experiences and all of your experiences. You think about how all of us and you guys listening experienced that from our couch watching on TV, or if anyone listening was at the game, Um, imagine being a player on the field, with a guy who you've sweat and, and bled next to every single day or your son, because you were brought down out of the stands and you're watching them perform CPR on him to save his life. And in the moment, not knowing if he was dead or alive when they loaded him into that ambulance. Um, that is the challenge of this next step. So you talk about the difficulty of me stammering, even transitioning here in topics and that us yeah. talking about it beforehand and that, Hey, did you have time to do any prep work on the Patriots to look into this matchup? And, you know, uh, you know, both Anthony and I pride ourselves on being as prepared as anybody in this business mm-hmm. and putting in the work to be ready to talk about these matchups and these things that we do. I didn't watch a single thing. I haven't thought one moment about this Patriots game coming up in that, I literally can't fathom what it's like to be a player and that someone we talk about all the reasons we love Sean McDermott. He's also pretty famously a kind of dogmatic regimented hardo that like that dude lives and breathes like the process and the, the step-by-step and the doing your job and all those different pieces. I really I genuinely wish I could have been a fly on the wall in those meeting rooms today to know what it's like in these moments of, you know, how do they try to switch gears and get ready to, like you talked about, a violent collision sport? How do you get yourself ready to now live in that world? It's such a it's just got to be, I don't want to say insurmountable, but it has to be such a large and taxing task to achieve and accomplish. And again, just to like tie it, like, like you, you spoke about you. So it's Wednesday. Usually by this time I've done disguise coverage at seven. So I finished. Um, but by this time I've watched the bills, all 22 offense and defense, usually multiple times, but obviously that doesn't happen this week. And then for their upcoming opponent, I've usually watched three full games of all 22 offense and defense, taking notes, I have a whole bunch of stuff ready and raring to go for the show and for the rest of the week and just my overall knowledge notification and all that. Exactly your point. I haven't, I haven't watched a clip of Patriots tape. I haven't, I've barely been at playing like, or paying attention to sports. I've really just been watching a lot of Netflix with my wife or trying to play video games or just zone out. Like, I haven't done anything. I haven't wanted to go near sports of any kind, really. Like we were talking offline. I watched the Sabres for a little bit last night, but I and I especially haven't wanted to go near football. And that's that's just me. Like, and that's just like you. And imagine how much harder it is when you're on the team or you're a coach, or like we were talking about offline, you're in the defensive back meeting room and you're going over stuff for for game prep, and you notice like where DeMar is usually seated, like he's not there. You're like, you're constantly reminded of him not being there wherever you go, whether it's in team meetings, individual meetings, walk through the weight room. Like maybe he usually drives to practice someday with somebody. Like there's all these reminders and how exactly your point, like we're having a problem preparing to watch it or cover it for what we do. Imagine having to prep for it on the field or off the field. Imagine, yeah, you're Sean McDermott, like who's all about regiment and routine and the process. And you got to put a game plan together after like, how do you, how do you transition to that? Be like, Hey guys, you know, we're still talking about DeMar. Okay. Let's put the tape on for the Patriots offense and let's go through this. Like, how do you transition? How do you get the buy-in? If you're the players, how do you soak in what you're seeing? How do you not just zone out staring at the tape 
and you're just constantly thinking about tomorrow. Like I can't imagine the mental exhaustion and the mental challenges that this team faces this week in prepping for an opponent that is playing for their playoff lives and is going to go super hard for a win. Oh, you're on mute. Happens every once in a while. Yeah, Not a team that's mailed it in, not a team no. that's, you know, uh season's already over and packed for, for Boca Raton. You know, it's, you know, a, a team that's fighting for their playoff lives, a division team, a team that cares, and that you made a comment earlier in, in prep, a, a team with maybe the best situational coach in, in yeah. NFL history. Um, I, I have confidence that a moment will come. Obviously, the best case scenario is we get a really nice positive update on DeMar Hamlin yeah. of his ability, you know, that, hey, he was taken mm -hmm. off and is breathing on his own and really taking a positive direction. And that, even though it's not, hey, he's all better, don't worry, he's going to be fine, it at least gives the momentary relief of mm -hmm. some of that anxiety to allow yourself yes. to compartmentalize. Some and concrete run. hope. To yeah, to, to the task forward. at hand. Um, so that's probably our best case scenario is that um, tomorrow we hear something a little bit firmer in a positive direction, and that gives them a Thursday, Friday, uh, even Saturday practice walkthrough mm -hmm. um, of a game at home, not having to go anywhere, um, being able to take care of those things. Uh, you know, shame on me. It is at home, right? I'm so honest. It is at home, correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. All right. But, Good. No, but that's but that's exactly the Progress. point right there. You're just like, is it at home? Like, yeah, I had to say, like, I I normally always know all those little things like that, even something as simple as that, and I had to second guess myself. Like, <laughs> it is at home, right? Um, so I do think that point can come. Yeah. Um, and that as hard as it is to fathom, I do think that especially if we get a positive update, if we don't. Yeah, I have some questions about whether they will play this game. And I, I don't, mm. as hard as it is to to grasp, I don't think it's out of the question that Sean McDermott could inform the league that the Bills forfeit this game. Mm. And that if, if again, God forbid, something took a turn for the worse with uh, DeMar's condition, I don't think that's out of the question. That they could be like, hey, we'll try to get back to things for the playoffs, but just I can't in good conscience put my guys out there if they're mm -hmm. not ready. So I don't believe Sean McDermott will do that. I don't believe he will put his players out there if they're not ready. And I do believe that a moment can come to give them the relief that they need to compartmentalize and get ready, especially if we get that positive update from yeah. on DeMar's status. So we'll all be waiting for that. We'll see where that goes. But let's you and I kind of think through, we're talking about a Patriots game. That game is scheduled for Sunday, unless something else happens that is going to ple be played Sunday as one at one. What happens to this Buffalo Cincinnati game? It was paused in the middle of the first quarter. It has incredible ramifications for three mm -hmm. different teams, not only four different teams, not only the Bills, not only the, the Bengals, the Bills uh, were in position for the number one seed. If they win the game, they would still be in position for the number one seed. The Bengals are fighting for their seeding anywhere from even a one, but mm -hmm. for sure a two and, and, pretend, and then a three seed, a division championship, and playing the Ravens. The Ravens, if the Bills had won and the Bengals lost, the Ravens could win uh, a division championship. If the Bills lose, the Chiefs could get the first the the first round or number one seed, the first round by and home field in the playoffs. All four teams have significant implications, whether the game is played or is not played, uh -huh. and all the scenarios of how this could go are are crazy in in where it goes. And I've seen a lot of them thrown out there. What are your thoughts on? How about this? What do you think we'll see and what do you want to see? You know, it's funny even trying to chart it. I feel like Charlie from Always Sunny with Pepe <laughs> Sylvia and he's got everything on the board and all the different charts. Like there is I no care on HR. <laughs> yeah. There is no care on HR, Mac. I think uh, I, I'm going to do this with a little bit of positivity yeah. in trying to kind of pay for it. I think before, real quick before you go, Carmelo's comment here. Uh, and yes, it's awesome that exactly. Carmelo Anthony is watching our show. Shout out to Carmelo. It's funny. Three to the head. Love it. Um, 
the best case scenario and what the NFL wants too is if the Raiders beat yeah. the Chiefs <laughs> and the Bills beat the Patriots, the Bengals game doesn't matter all of a sudden. And they're like, yep, yeah. Bills are the number one seed, Chiefs are the two seed, and they just let the Bengals and Ravens game decide their their division and like, hey, look, it's all clean. We're good to go. Um, I, I think technically the Bengals would lose out on the chance of the two jumping to the two, the but in the yeah, grand scheme Kansas. of things, it's a little bit cleaner. Yeah. Um, but again, assuming assuming the Raiders don't do us all a huge favor, what do we think is going to happen? I would love that. I went into the same situation last year though with Denver going and playing against Kansas City in Week 17, and it, yeah, go Raiders, like Pops Moppy says, a thousand percent. I think again, and this is part of my what I think is going to happen. And also with what my heart wants for DeMar, hoping we get some positivity and then the bills play this weekend. And then I think, I think we're going to see. So I, I think that's done and dusted. I think we're going to start to see that scenario that I think Mike Florio laid out that people started running with where you would have week 19 and the bills would play the Bengals. The NFC wild card round would take place. The AFC, the AFC playoffs would have a buy. Then the next week, the AFC wildcard round would take place and the NFC playoffs would have a bye. There's all these, again, the multitude of Pepe Silvia scenarios that can happen in terms of if, if, if it's ruled a no contest, if it's ruled a tie, um, if it's ruled a no contest, that would require manipulation of the playoff seating qualifications, which would be carried out by Roger Goodell in consultation with the, with the clubs. Um, there's actually a tremendous article um, by Jonathan Jones on CBSSports.com, who lays out like everything in terms of, especially he goes into the emergencies and unfair acts provision in the policy manual for the game operations, according to the NFL rule book and breaks down everything. Which but the, the, uh, one quick point to throw out there, the reason that exists and is as detailed as what it is, is because of during the COVID season in 2020. Thank you yes. very much, Carl. I really appreciate yeah, the awesome, Carl. Um, they had to, there were scenarios. We remember they almost canceled that Bills Titans game that they had yep. to move twice. They almost had to cancel a couple games. They had to put that in there. Hey, what do we do if we actually have to cancel a game? Yeah. And that kind of set some precedent. You know, Troy Vincent talked about it uh, today as well in terms of how they were able to finagle things uh, through the 2020 season with COVID um, and all those things will kind of like guide them through the conversation. I think because because that Bills Bengals game has so much implication, like significant implication. It's not just like, well, it affects this one team. Like 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 you laid out, it has very real consequences for the top four teams, and then by extension, well, for at least four teams, I should say. But then by extension, all the other teams that they would play in throughout the AFC, like there's large scale ramifications for the entire AFC side of the bracket, which makes me think from an NFL perspective, it has to get played. And if it has to get played, that scenario where it gets played next week and we have the playoff bye for the AFC, NFC, and then they kind of rotate and do that piece. I know it adds extra bye weeks and time off and muddies the waters, but the whole point of it all, like there is no easy solution. There's no clean cut like, oh, just do this. Whatever you do, somebody's going to kind of feel like they lost a little bit or they're going to feel yeah they're going to feel like hard done out like there's there's no right way to make everybody win i think troy vincent i was finding the quote he said it um today he said their whole thing is making sure the proper equity is in place and as we saw potentially there may be a lack of equity or it may not be perfect but it'll allow those who are participating or who have earned the right to play to continue to play. So I think they've kind of made their peace with, you know, somebody's going to have to bite the bullet. It's just how big of a bullet do they have to bite? Yeah. So I, I do think um, some people have brought up, Hey, you should bump back all the wild card week and just play Bill's Bengals next week um, in week 19. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about any scenario that involves taking away huge swaths of television and marketing and ad revenue yeah sadly is is not realistic even That's if the it's the right thing this. to do yeah. um and they did on monday night like I, the, mm -hmm. we've already seen they did the right thing monday night they didn't put guys back out there to keep playing and to force them through this so i will say they've already shown that money doesn't always win mm -hmm. um but that was also unprecedented and in the moment and very emotional. And we're now getting removed from that. 
Mm-hmm. So I don't think that's realistic. They're not bumping back all the playoffs and canceling the, the week between the conference championship and the Super Bowl to play one game. I do think there's a compromise in doing the Bills Bengals game and the NFC games, which you're still talking about three games. So mm-hmm. you're still talking about a four game weekend. Um, and then coming back the next week and playing the AFC wild card round, which again is three more games. Um, to be able to go through and do. I do think that that's feasible. I don't know that it's likely. I, I You're still talking about cancel in the week between the um, the the conference championship and the Super Bowl. And the Pro and, Bowl is Super Bowl is super important. The Pro Bowl super happens important. that weekend. The Everybody Bowl cares about the Pro Bowl, Greg. Yeah, Very, very important. <laughs> um, shout out, you know, Lauren. And, and again, we I did oh, put awesome. in the comments here, any contributions made tonight, we are going to donate to the DeMar Hamlin Fund. Um, so we really appreciate your generosity. It's, it's very, yeah, very thank kind you, of Lauren. Lauren. Um, she's a good one. So she is. She is good. Uh, so I, I don't know that that's the most likely, but it's the the least crazy of the scenarios I've seen thrown out that involve the Bills and the Bengals playing their game. Yes, I think if they play their game, that's the one that I can wrap my mind around from a business standpoint, from a TV scheduling yes. standpoint, from a broadcast standpoint from a money standpoint, I can wrap my head around that one. Hmm. I think the most likely scenario is that kind of what Troy Vincent started to lay the groundwork for is that guys, we can't make it up. There's no real way to reverse engineer what we think might've happened. I've seen people say, you know, give both teams a win in the record book uh, or, Hey, call it a tie or whatever. Like, any scenario that they don't play that game means that Kansas City will get the one seed and they'll get the bye. And it's just how it's going to work. And that, you know, is that great? No, it's not. It's not great. Um, does that mean the Ravens now don't really have a shot at winning their division because they didn't get the loss for the Bengals that they needed? Yep, that kind of stinks. It's just, yep, it does. Um, all of those things. I, we need to prepare ourselves that that is, I think, the most likely scenario here. I think the most likely scenario is that the you know Sean McDermott, on behalf of the team, tells um, Roger Goodell and Trey Vincent and the NFL leadership that hey, it's going to take everything that we've got to get our minds around playing any of these games. Yeah, let alone backtracking to get in an extra game. Um, I'm just, we're just trying, we're hanging on by a thread here, man. We're just trying to get through this. Our focus is elsewhere. We're just trying to get through this to be able to survive. We don't need to backtrack and try to add in an extra game. We just don't. Um, I think that's the most likely scenario. I think that the most likely scenario is we, we hear in the next couple of days that we're just going to kind of chalk that up as a no contest. The Bengals and the bills will play 16 games. And that the Bills, even if they win against the Patriots, their thirteen and three is going to be one less win than the the Chiefs fourteen and three, and it is what it is. And the Bills will be the two seed, and the Bengals, you know, I, I, assuming they beat the Ravens, will be mm-hmm. the three seed, and that's just how it'll be. And that we'll just move forward. And it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Um, I won't be um, upset. Or disappointed if they do the Mm -hmm. other Mike Florio solution and figure out a way to do this and give the Bills a shot to not only still have the one seed, but then earn a buy the week after uh, and get that week off to kind of, um, you know, catch their breath, per se. Um, Maybe Mm -hmm. even as crazy as it sounds, uh, maybe get Micah Hyde back. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I'm knocking on wood super hard right now. (laughs) Um, So, you know, some of those things, I, I, I won't be upset. I just... I don't know how realistic all those changes are to make that happen. I think that's a super fair point. I, and somebody, I think Rick mentioned in the comments um, that Chris brought up, it's the whole nature of like, how much is, how much does the NFL lean into what's best for the bills and or Bengals and what's best for the business model and money and the league as a whole and which one do they lead into? And you can make a case for anything. I also wouldn't be surprised if, if for some reason the bills and Patriots didn't play this weekend, I also wouldn't be surprised at that. I think there's like a realistic Avenue. Yeah. There's, there's literally like, 
almost every scenario that has been laid out by someone is on the table in a realistic fashion to some degree. It may be less in terms of like odds and percentages than others, but there's a realistic path to a multitude of scenarios and options that have been laid out here. And you can make the case for anything. And I think part of that is just because, you know, I think, uh, you know, Deion Dawkins already talking about like everything, all our efforts are focused towards, you know, DeMar and worried about DeMar. And then you had the statement, I forget from who in the league, talking about that, you know, whatever happens with like the bills, like it'll be made, you know, the decision will be made by, by the bills and Sean McDermott in terms of what they want to do going forward. And that's all going to be based on how they're feeling. And you can't predict human emotion and someone's yeah. mental state. Like for all we know, the team might wake up tomorrow and they might feel somewhat better about, Oh, that's awesome. Aaron. Thank you very much for the donation and the comment there as well. Supporting and, tomorrow. And, and again, I, I will interject there that I do think, whatever the next status update is on DeMar Hamlin directly impacts the option. Yes. The more positive and encouraging the update is, the more likely the Bills play the Patriots and the more likely they try to fit this game in. The more unknown, no update, or God forbid a negative update on DeMar Hamlin, the less likely they're going to find a way to fit these games in and the less prepared this team is going to be to be able you know you can't ask them to compartmentalize if their their friend and their brother and their their teammates life is still hanging in the balance Mm -hmm. i I just don't i think that's unreasonable to ask and i do think that as you know simplistic and maybe over simplistic as it may sound i do think whatever the status update on damar hamlin is has a direct correlation on what these options end up being No, I completely agree. And that's why, you know, my initial prediction, like I prefaced it with like a little bit of my heart and trying to like push good vibes forward because my hope is we get some good news and then it's like, cool, so we can play both these games and everything will be okay. But I think exactly to your point, his status directly impacts the path forward in a variety of ways. Because if it's if it's unknown to not great, I think there it significantly lowers the odds of both games getting played and both games, meaning bills, Patriots, and then bills, Bengals. Like if if he takes a turn for the negative or it's still unknown and murky, the odds of them bringing the bills and Bengals back together to play this game and finish it out, I think are close, very slim at best because of the optics of it. And just also like the mental status of everybody, like you, everybody's going to have to play still not knowing what's going on or knowing what happened in a negative way. Like it's, it's, it's 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 a huge domino uh, piece and chain reaction starter. Yeah. So you know, there's um, a handful that I, obviously this is another one that I was a little confused by that got some somehow negative reaction. I, I'll encourage people not to go read the comments on this. Um, that the Bills did make a transaction today. Mm-hmm. Um, they did sign Jaron Maiden, who was a safety out of Alabama, who was undrafted, spent some time with the 49ers. Obviously, you can see from this picture, he actually <laughs> was on the Bills practice squad um, earlier this season um, and then was released and brought back. Um, this is standard procedure. They, mm-hmm. They, you know, obviously, we, <clears throat> everyone hoping for the best for DeMar Hamlin he's not going to be in condition to play again. And that regardless of when we think that is, I I do think the bills play again. I do think that Mm -hmm. at a minimum by the playoffs, I do think they play again and they'll need someone on the team. I like, I, I understand this is an incredibly emotional situation. Uh, People are always going to have a reaction. I feel people were reacting to this post. Like, your mom got remarried the day after your dad's <laughs> funeral. Like, it's like, come on, man. Like this isn't, this, there is no slight to mm-hmm. Damar Hamlin. This, there is no, um, it was just really weird. Like I, when someone commented, like if anybody needs, you know, to feel better about themselves, you know, go, you're not the people in the comments here below. And I was like, what do you mean? And I started scrolling through and I was like, Oh my God, what, what is wrong with people? Like, what, yeah. how could you even have this reaction? Um, so yes, the Bills added safety Jared Maiden to their practice squad because they need a safety. Um, they did. Re- it's funny they added him to the practice squad, but they released Xavier Rhodes. Mm-hmm. And um, here, Lauren said I was more surprised Same. by the release of of Xavier Same. Rhodes. Um, 
that's because they're about to activate Christian Benford. Mm -hmm. So that one's kind of the reason that that happened. It seemed like these were connected and they really weren't. Um, Jared Maiden was added because we need another safety Mm -hmm. around the building. Um, Xavier Rhodes was released because they're about, they opened up the practice window for Christian Benford and it actually, I almost guarantee that one is announced by tomorrow at four o'clock. Yeah. Um, Christian Benford will be added back to the active roster because his IR timing is up. Um, yeah, so that was a that sneaky one, kind of activation off the IR the last couple of weeks. Yeah. I feel like that kind of flew under the radar and people weren't yeah. aware of it. Yeah, they, they opened up his practice window. And I yeah. honestly, I almost think like the last day was like today. <laughs> they, they, they had. Um, so I actually think they have to make that announcement tomorrow by four o'clock. Um, that's but yeah, yeah they, I expect to see that. That was That's yeah. your standard process. That is no slight that doesn't like some people thought it meant they were releasing Demar Hamlin that just a lot of people who again when we talk about the reach that this had outside mm-hmm. of football it brought in people who weren't familiar with the machinations of how roster management mm-hmm. works um this everyone should have expected this this is very normal this is has nothing to do with their focus and attention and prayer for Demar Hamlin and his spot on the roster and on the team and in the organization. This is simply this. They need another safety to run practice. Like literally like that's how, (laughs) that's how this works. One of the guys who used to be one of the practice ones, like Cam Lewis or whoever now is going to be on the other side of the defense and they need another guy to run practice. That's literally all this is. It's just a, yeah, exactly to your point. It's just like the brass brass tacks of roster construction and a, I get the heightened emotion of it sure, and the people sure. necessarily not know like, Oh my God, does this mean like DeMar is no longer a bill or, or maybe even some people wanted like, I don't know. I I'm also trying to think of like possibilities. Maybe somebody or people out there wanted like, <clears throat> no, don't fill the roster spot and leave it open as like a symbolic <laughs> like gesture or kind of like, um, when the bill bills played Washington all those years ago and Washington started the game with 10, 10 players on defense to honor Sean Taylor. Um, so I was thinking maybe people were looking for like a symbolic gesture or something sure. like that potentially, but no, this is to your point, like kind of standard fare. Um, it doesn't mean that they don't care or it doesn't mean that things are taking a turn or that he's done or anything like that. This is, even if DeMar comes out, wakes up tomorrow and everything is ship shape, odds are he's probably not playing again this year. So they just need to fulfill that roster spot in order to kind of push forward, um, and uh, oh, so yeah, good comment from Rick there saying he was yeah. at that Bills Washington game. Yeah, it's just brass tacks of it. Unfortunately, yeah. it yeah. comes at kind of I guess an inopportune time, but it it's something that had to be done. Um, I, I guess here to Elizabeth's question there that was just up on the the screen before. Um, do you think it'll be Cam Lewis or Jaquan Johnson that plays against? Oh boy, hey, I, oh, I guess with the with the pairing of Poyer. I'd probably say Cam Lewis. I think so. Um, I know uh, Jaquan, I mean, let, let's be honest, they both have their limitations, um, sure. but I think the pairing with Poyer probably makes more sense for Cam Lewis. But then also, again, it's I don't Patriots, know, they run a lot. That's exactly they do a lot of jumbo thinking. sets. And this game actually might, I know everybody still probably wants to take torches and pitchforks to Jaquan Johnson, but he is good around the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Um, yeah. Granted, he has his speed limitations, as Michael Carter showed us in that Jets game, but his skill set. The Patriots don't have a, bra- a Brees Hall. No, and Ramondre Stevenson is a very good back, but he's not a pure burner. Um, yeah. Again, you're going to have your limitations in some regard. Potentially, Jaquan could work. I know some people are also clamoring for Marlowe. Um, I, I kind of hope it's Marlow. I just, I, I'm reading, they haven't put him out there yet. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. They, that's I a very know. interesting and telling. Oh, you very much, Daniel. That's awesome, Daniel. Thank you so much. We appreciate you um, appreciating us and awesome. The, the kind words for DeMar. Yeah. It's been weird that they brought him back. And then I think each week like, people were like, oh, it's going to be Marlow. It's going to be Marlow. And then it kept being like, nope, 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 nope. And so, <sighs> Where there's smoke, maybe there's it will, fire? maybe it will, maybe, you know, because yeah. there, there, there was a moment where it was, um, it, it was, <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> there was a moment where, oh, well, Marlo just got there, and then right after that, Poyer came back, yes, and then it became, oh, well, okay, it makes sense that it's Demar. So, we don't, they actually haven't had an opportunity since then to now decide what so maybe it would have been marlo if he had the ramp up time 
Mm-hmm. And now we'll see that, but yeah. um, I, I'm not expecting that. And then I will say, I, Joe Biscalia is not one to blow smoke about things, and he's continued to talk about Micah Hyde returning in a tone that I'm going to try to phrase this very carefully. As long as nothing changes and there is no new setback. I now am of the mindset that Micah Hyde will return. I think that he is going to return and that he is going to play in the playoffs. Now, something and the between, Bills will win the Super Bowl. Keep it going. <laughs> and that with him, the Bills will win the Super Bowl and they will come off of the podium and hand the trophy to DeMar Hamlin, who will be there at the Super Bowl. And it will be one of the most joyous events in sports history. Very nice. Create your own adventure. I would turn to page 84 for, to choose that ending in this book. Um, th- so that is what I am manifesting into reality. Um, okay. So now that doesn't mean that between now and that event happening, that some doctor, some medical update, Chucky Wookie, that's awesome. All the way from Australia. Appreciate you. you and so again, much. as we had stated earlier, all proceeds from the show, yeah. whether that's, you know, revenue from people watching the ads or watching on YouTube or the things that come up um, th- that will be going to the DeMar Hamlin fund for, for everything that we do tonight. Um, it, I, I do think all the work he's put in on the side, the way he's approached practice, like he's playing mm-hmm. and that everything mm-hmm. that's there, which means there hasn't been a setback yet because he wouldn't keep doing that. If Correct. there was a setback, if like if something came up where they're like, hey, sorry, man, it's not going to work. This happened in your last scan. We're not comfortable with it. What that means is that hasn't happened yet. It's been good. It's checked out. And that Kyle Trimble said that it was unlikely but possible. And if if he hit every check mark along the way, technically wildcard weekend would mark four months and that that would be the moment where it could happen and that that would be how it would work. Um, and that it would be possible, but unlikely. So the, the approach here, I'm now of the mindset that I believe, uh, and, and the semantics autumn here asking, um, yes, we haven't even used close to our eight, mm-hmm. uh, IR recalls. Yeah, right. I think we've only used like three, maybe. Um, yeah, ballpark. so yeah, because I, I like I, I don't. There's a couple of things I don't know if Ike Botker counted against that because he was on yeah. PUP, and I don't know if you it was IR. Um, we've had you know so the the ones that have got like Christian Benford will about to be one. The same thing, Trey White, he was on PUP. I'm not 100 mm-hmm. percent on what that counts yeah, as. Yeah, that muddies it. Um, so we've used like three or four elevations, but we have eight total. So even if the PUP ones count the same out of the same bucket, which someone told Fine. me they did, and we'll go with that for the moment. Um we for sure haven't used eight. So even if it's four or five, even we have not used eight, we have up to eight for the season. So we definitely have uh, an IR elevation left. Um, (laughs) But the, the approach that they've had, (laughs) it's remained up as a safety. Hey, you never know. Um, (laughs) So the, the approach that they've had tells me that they haven't had that setback and that it is possible and that he's continued last week he was still practicing and doing that same work. Uh So now that doesn't mean that between now and then there can't be another checkup scan that tells him, Hey man, it's just not healing the way that we need. We can't risk it. Or or that a doctor advises him or that he simply talks to his wife and decides that you want to know what it's not the right thing. We're not ready to risk this, but short of one of those things happening, we are now at a point and I won't lie. Some people have asked me and I'll ask you this. You know, seeing that happen with DeMar and the situation it puts the team in, man, I can't think of something that would be more motivating of, oh, you can be the guy that comes in and saves the day, you know, to step in for your brother that now is is down bad. Like, I, it, maybe it makes him question his career and maybe he decides to retire. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I have no idea. Yeah. Like, there's all kinds of things in the spectrum of how people react to that experience um right now i believe we will see micah hyde in a bills uniform in the playoffs this season 
ever since I saw the first footage of him, like getting work on the sideline and then do exactly your point. Like it, it's kept continuing. Like the, the pessimist in me is like, well, he's just trying to stay in shape and he's just like working. It's part of like the rehab process. But then the other part of me is like, nah, he's coming back. And exactly like what you said, like Joe Buscalia is, is pretty reliable. He doesn't just put things out into the ether to put things out. Into he's the actually conservative to the nth degree. He almost never Fair puts yeah. stuff out there because he's super careful not to project or guess yeah. and is very, very careful about it. So him talking about it at all is an indicator to me. Yes. And he didn't back off it. Like he's, yes. he put it out there and he's like, st- he stood pat and yet you, you you bring up the two like emotional pieces. Like on the one hand, you do have like, okay, do I see what happened to Demar, and do I kind of see my own mortality in that and my own career, and how does that make me feel? Especially again, coming off of a legitimately serious injury that he had and had surgery for and has been rehabbing. So on the one hand, you have that, and then on the other side, yeah, you get to kind of come right in on the white horse and potentially be like a hero of sorts in a situation. And not to mention knowing like, not even just from like a, a selfish standpoint for him, but the emotional lift, I think for the fan base and for the players, let alone his added benefit of being on the field, I think is that's awesome from Dan quoting you there. So you're saying there's a non-zero chance. Well done. <laughs> like, I think that also plays in like, that's the positive emotion side of it, knowing the boost that you can give this team on the field, but also from like a support standpoint, the emotional standpoint and the, the positivity standpoint of you being actually back um, and putting things together. That would be, man, that, that, that would be something. And I, I'm very superstitious. As you know, I don't predict game scores. I am leaning in that direction and I'm going to knock on wood a bunch as I say it. Cause I don't want to jinx it. I, I am very, uh, I'm in a similar camp as you. I will say that. <laughs> so as far as we'll I'm... see. Yeah, we'll see where all those things go. Um, everything that that comes from it um, that's there. Uh, we hope that tonight was, you know, uh, a cathartic exercise for you. I will say uh, I have one ask of anything here. If you guys don't mind, pause right now what you're doing. Hit the like button for us. It really does help a lot. Um, tonight was a difficult choice for us of whether we came and did this show. We tried to take a serious, respectful tone to uh, the show, to, to what we wore, to what the background on the show was, to whether we did this at all. Um, if you guys appreciated that or this helped you be able to kind of think about um, this situation, what we all dealt with and experienced, then all I ask in return is to, to go and press that like button. It really helps us out um, and, and shares more uh, about what's going on. Um, I'm hopeful uh, you'll see um, obviously part of this was we knew the topic made sense to do a joint show, uh, but there weren't three of us here. So unfortunately it's because uh, my normal co-host uh, Aaron Quinn um, unfortunately has COVID and is uh, at home trying to get better. Uh, I am hopeful that he is going to be ready for our post game show um, on Sunday so that uh, if the bills and Patriots play, which as of right now, I expect to happen. Um, he will be back with me to do that. Um, and that hopefully that will be uh, Anthony back with you next week on disguise coverage, breaking down what we saw in that bills Patriots game and maybe talking about a bills Bengals game or getting ready for the AFC wildcard round and probably playing the, I don't know if it'd be the chargers or maybe the Patriots again, back to back or the Ravens yeah. or the, I don't know. There's a whole couple other options. It could be in there. The Steelers even, I, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Where, where I that just one goes. The Steelers never go away. I just feel like they're going to make the playoffs somehow. I, somehow. Total aside, oh. I'm not going to open up a new content topic here tonight. If Mike Tomlin didn't have a losing record this year, the man is never going to have a losing <laughs> record. Like if that, you know, roster and TJ Watt being gone for the majority of the season and rookie quarterback and all the other crap, the dude's just never going to have a losing season. Never. He's unbelievable. No. He's um, so make sure you're checking it out. I know, you know, we kind of paused everything that was going on here. So we're going to have some different things. I know the guys of if the walls could talk in Buffalo are going to be on tomorrow and having some people on talking about what it's like to manage some of these serious health situations in Don's experience, having to do that in the past with the team. Um, I think the guys from Going Deep, Kevin and Mike, are going to be going live tomorrow night on Thursday night 
talking a little bit more about the matchup, having Mark Schofield on uh, to talk a little more Patriots. Hopefully that's because we get a really nice update about DeMar Hamlin. Um, we may be doing some spaces if, if things come up. So uh, there we go. Josh talking about the, the show. They'll be on 11 a.m. tomorrow uh, being able to go live. Um, we'll see where some of the other things go. If we get some good updates and we can really feel comfortable compartmentalizing and shifting into game mode maybe we do a spaces and jump on there uh anthony and i did one of those uh the other night that was kind of fun yeah. um so maybe we'll jump on and do another one of those at some point here if we get some good news that lets us kind of shift gears um but beyond that we really appreciate your guys time um jumping in here the the chat was awesome but way more you guys jumped in to watch tonight than i expected yeah. um being able to be here that was really awesome and it makes me feel good about our decision to do this tonight and uh i hope it was a, a good experience for you guys i hope that we struck the right tone and approach um with the seriousness of everything going on and, and that means a lot that you guys would give us your time here tonight any final thoughts for uh for our, our show tonight or what's coming up next or anything else that you feel no just um I think you hit it on the head. It was, I, I didn't know what to expect from a turnout standpoint tonight or what the vibe would be or the mood. And, you know, that it was just really encouraging to see um, everybody's engagement and the support for the team, for DeMar, for one another, for just the whole situation of, of what was going on. And yeah, it, to your point, I think it reinforced, you know, I was, I was in a weird space figuring out if I was going to do disguise coverage or what I was going to do. And so that's why I reached out to you and it, it, it was cool to kind of, do this collaboration mashup type of show. And then the turnout that we got um, on top of it, and you know, it was a real positive thing. And hopefully it's an, another positive thing and a road of positive things for DeMar Hamlin and this team. As, as we go forward, it was a really, um, you know, it was a really, a really, really good turnout tonight um, considering yeah. the situation and how wishy-washy we were internally about everything that's going on. It was uh yeah, tremendously appreciated. Thank you to everyone. And um, yeah, good times. Yeah, 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 couldn't say it better. So uh, thank you very much. Our, our producer, Chris Kepner, doing a great job bringing up your guys' comments and helping us get ready for tonight. Um, all the guys uh, and, and ladies and, and everyone in the, the chat was fantastic. We appreciate you. Um, but on behalf of Anthony Prohaska, I'm Greg Thompson. You've been listening to Cover One Buffalo in Disguise Coverage, and we are.